Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Take a load off, everybody. All right. Um, welcome back to week two out of five in this December series on rest that dovetails intentionally with Advent and and helps us ring in the new year. Uh, this is all about seeking that space of peace and stillness and ensuring that we have uh, time protected to be and breathe in the midst of all that there is to do. Uh, week one last week, uh, we kicked off the series recognizing that rest is the sum total of that which recharges us in our life. It's way bigger than sleep, but it includes sleep as one part of that. We'll get into more of that uh, for uh, today's theme. In the coming weeks, we're going to bridge over into, like, how do you do this in a practical sense? How do you protect time for rest in a 24-7, on-demand kind of world? And uh, next week, we'll look at how do we rest in weekly rhythms, and then in week four, uh, how do we rest in rhythms throughout the year? And then in week five, we're going to move toward making a New Year's resolution together as a congregation so that in 2019 in as much as we can influence it we experience a more peaceful and restful life as individuals as households as an entire church and it stands to reason that in that state of being we have more peace to share with others that we can truly be available when we're called to be available to others. This week we're going to dive into daily rest more. And throughout this series, uh, you're going to get uh, these handouts that are inserted in the worship folder. You can pull this out. The intention of this is that you can uh, refer to this during the message so as to not use sermon time as sleep time. Okay. Uh, and then also that you can take it home and begin to apply these kinds of things uh, in your home life. This does involve a bit of a gut check and if you did the inventory from last week perhaps you had this flare firing that says man this rest stuff maybe I'm not doing as well as I thought I was and maybe this spares a little more intentionality for me and if you're in that place I have good news for you as we move forward okay uh, today the crux of the matter is this daily rest involves upholding two what I will call spiritual disciplines in our daily rhythm. We rest daily through sleep and through quiet time with God. Those are iron rations of rest in a 24-7, on-demand kind of world. It's not to say that they are the sum total of what you can or should experience on a daily basis, but let's consider these iron rations. See, this is fundamentally a different spiritual issue than it was in biblical times. Due to increases and improvements in technology that have added numerous benefits to our lives and have at the same time taken things away from us. It's kind of interesting to think about. I'll share with you this quote to kind of get our minds around how a day is different today than in biblical times. From the book Margin, which you can check out at the Resource Center if you so choose. The first mechanical clocks were alarms of sorts, introduced in the Western world during the 1200s. Only a bell indicated time. In the 1300s, the dial and the hour hand were added. Here was man's declaration of independence from the sun, new proof of his mastery over himself and his surroundings, explains historian Daniel Borstein. Only later would it be revealed that he had accomplished this mastery by putting himself under the dominion of a machine with imperious demands all its own. 
In fact, the state of things uh, today is that we live in a world where we measure time, not even down to the nanosecond, but to the, what, femtosecond or something like that, right? And it's, it's crazy, the precision which, with which we account for the passing of time, and we live within that system. But then there's more. In 1879, Thomas Edison produced the first electric light. If the clock broke up the day, the light bulb broke up the night. Humanity was flushed with its presumed victory over yet another of nature's limitations, yet all victories have their associated costs. And so the clock and the light, they gifted us with time and they stole it away. Whoa. This is the world that we live in. And so a day presents a different kind of spiritual battlefield than it did before. And kind of contrary to the ways that we're used to thinking about our daily choices, what this means is that we're situated well within the Corinthian dilemma. It's a similar kind of thing as was going on before, and yet it expresses itself differently. See, Paul says in two different places in his letter to the Corinthians, I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. We live in a world of infinite possibilities of how we're going to divide up any given passing of 24 hours of time. And there is beauty in that possibility. And yet the very nature of it means that it's not so cut and dry between like decisions of like the bad thing and the good thing over here. And that I'll be on the right track if I simply choose the good thing over and against the bad thing. It works in this kind of way instead. It's more like you can say yes to a billion good things and inadvertently schedule out the best thing. This is our dilemma. This is the spiritual battlefield in which we live, saying enough intentional no's in order to preserve a yes for the best things. This is how we try to live in this time. And it's tricky because those no's to good things mean no's to people that we want to be connected to and, and to help out and things that we find exciting and worthwhile and all of these kinds of things. But it's in the very curating of our time that we find the balances restored and goodness preserved in our life. Right? So in Isaiah's day, the hopeful note of that Advent Christmas reading in Isaiah 9 is that the people walking in darkness have now seen a great light, that there was this inherent darkness that surrounded them. The dilemma now is almost like, what time within this world of endless light can we preserve for experiencing the beauty and the gift of the darkness? This brings me to our first spiritual discipline, sleep. There's all kinds of interesting things that go through my mind as I consider standing here as your pastor and preaching to you about sleep as though it's a spiritual uh, discipline and something new and exciting to pursue. It used to be that sleep was a given, but not so in a world in which the light can extend throughout all hours of the night. See, it's widely recognized that sleep, the average person in our world, not every single person, but the averages for someone, it's widely recognized in the medical uh, community, in the scientific community, uh, all of these sorts of things across the board, that seven to eight hours of sleep is kind of that average range of wellness for people. To which we can pause right now and just go, Because ah! how many of us in this room are getting, are protecting seven to eight hours of sleep a night? 
on average, we get instead between five and six and a half hours of sleep a night. And the thing is, it doesn't sound like we're cutting corners that badly. That sounds like, oh, we're just, you know, a little below average in that thing. And we tend to think of ourselves that we're the type of people who are stronger among the others in that select field. And so we ourselves are the people who need that five hours of rest or less and can exist well on that. But see, I think that living consistently in this rhythm of sleep deprivation is kind of like taking a pair of shoes that are two or three sizes too small, shoving your feet into those shoes, and then running a marathon. That's the kind of wear and tear that we exact on our bodies through regular choices of sleep deprivation. I saw it at work in college as I tried on the college all-nighter as a personal practice, and as I saw other people do it, it's like, well, you can gain over here and then you really lose on the other side of it. And it just continues to work that way. Neuroscientist Russell Foster outlines in his TED Talk on the neuroscience of sleep that sleep deprivation is directly linked to accidents that have occurred in workplaces, like accidents that have had global kinds of repercussions, the likes of Chernobyl and other kinds of things, directly linked to sleep deprivation. Also, accidents in the car and falling asleep at the wheel, poor judgment, increased impulsiveness, obesity and diabetes, stress, and even mental illness. That sleep deprivation is directly linked to decreased memory ability and recall, decreased problem-solving and creative ability. And so you can gain on the one end, but you will inevitably pay for it or lose in it on the other end of things. But these patterns of behavior are very much exemplified in the attitudes that we carry about sleep. Uh, listen to this quote from Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb. Sleep is a criminal waste of time inherited from our cave days. I mean, don't we kind of think that a little bit? That we should be able to get by on less. It's a waste. For Margaret Thatcher, sleep is for wimps. <laughs> Margaret putting on her Arnold kind of uh, impression or this kind of thing, right? We think these things to ourselves at times when we're trying to push through and accomplish things that have uh, very strict deadlines and we push ourselves through those barriers of listening to our body in those kinds of ways. See, it turns out uh, that since this is a different spiritual issue, the, the Bible doesn't speak of it in the same kind of way and yet there are plenty of biblical texts that lead us into rhythms around sleep and rest. It starts even in the good old book of Genesis, chapter 1. In the cadence of the creating, it says, there was evening and there was morning, and it says it with each successive day. This is, a, this is showing us the Hebraic reckoning of time. That a day, any given day, starts at sundown on one day and then it ends on sundown uh, the next day. And that's how they account for it. Which means that the very first things in the day is what? The rest part, the darkness part. And the next part is the light and answerable to people kind of part. I think there's something important of wisdom to gain from this Genesis reading. Mercy's new every morning, Lamentations talks about, that every single morning that you rise and awake, God's forgiveness and evidences of his grace are etched upon every one of those days that you rise to face, that each day, and by extension, each night, you get to unwrap the gift of God 
Psalm 113 verse 3 says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Think about this. We worship a God who in the way in which he became flesh, in our day-to-day -day reality, he never slept at all and he always answered the calls that people were presenting to him, right? That's how you read the Gospels, isn't it? Jesus was on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I am being sarcastic in this moment. When we read the Gospels and we attend to the passage of time, we see that days passed and Jesus slept. That he acknowledged his human limitations. If God himself in the flesh slept while he walked the earth, then maybe we can follow after. Jesus, he slept through storms. He fell asleep on that cushion in the boat through exhaustion of the demands that were being placed on him, and yet he slept when the wind and the waves were raging, right? At times, the wind and the waves can rage in our lives with this sea of incomplete tasks and things that are not just so. Let's take a cue from Jesus and try to rest in a cadence even when things are not yet completely right. Jesus woke and he calmed the storm, calling forth peace. Right? So friends, here's the bottom line. Sleep is a gift from God. It's like a Christmas gift that we get to unwrap every single day of the 365 days of the year. And so let's not leave that gift sitting at the base of the tree each day, but let's unwrap that and enjoy the fullness of that every single day that we can. Stillness. See, it's part of our freedom as children of God to enjoy peaceful sleep and to be off the clock. Stillness, right? Uh, not only is it important to kind of protect that time for sleep, and my proposal to you is this, nothing less than that in our 24-7 on-demand world, we actually physically have to schedule in times for rest so that we don't inadvertently schedule over it or give it away without realizing it. In our waking time, experiencing quiet time with God is an important thing. Maybe a standard to strive toward is something like 20 to 30 minutes a day in the midst of your waking moments. And that's not to say that's all that's possible, but sleep along with quiet time dedicated in the presence of God is sort of like the iron rations that help you get you through the day and help you be available to the people that you are called to serve during that time. All right. Whereas sleep restores us physically, this quiet time with God, it refuels us spiritually. Mark 135 through 37 gives us that fundamental dilemma, and we see Jesus wrestling with it, okay? It's on the handout. It's the second quote down. It says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went to a solitary place where he prayed. Think of it, Jesus wasn't always answerable to people. He disappeared for periods of time in order to not have things asked of him. He went off the clock, God himself, right? Um, interesting to consider that. Now, quiet time with God, there's a strong bi biblical precedent for this being experienced or being able to be experienced early in the morning. There's lots of verses, and I'll share some more of them with you on that. Now, that being said, are we all morning people? Are we all ready to, you know, be attentive to the things of God right there at the first of the day? Not necessarily. So what happens? Jesus goes and he tries to preserve this off-the-clock time. And then it says, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. People who are in the throes of parenting and perhaps trying to balance uh, careers, can you relate? This sense of feeling viscerally in your body 
that there is so much of your waking moment where you are in demand. You can hardly do the basic functions of life without having some little kid, snot-nosed kid, kind of tugging at you, trying to uh, encroach on that time, right? Not that I know anything about that, or that Kendra does. <laughs> we love our kids. We pursue patterns of rest on a daily basis, rhythms of rest in our waking moments uh, in different kinds of ways for ourselves. We can't always do it together. We need to do it uh, separately, but we need to help each other get it done. See, there was this critical conversation that we had a little while back where we were asking, like, are you feeling rested? And how are things going with us? And we found out that, really, Kendra was doing a lot of the household tasks that were more stress-inducing early in the morning. And so she'd get up and kind of fly into the flurry of making lunches and the like. Meanwhile, I was out walking the dog and enjoying some great bliss, uh, it, you know, and this kind of thing. And we went... Well, maybe that can change. And so we flipped it. And all of a sudden, then, a new pattern kind of emerged out of that. And, and it was this, that I'm making the lunches, and she's out walking the dog, and she's not having kids tugging at her. And you know what? Even in that, I can take and reclaim some of that time. It's not the same as dedicated rest time, but because there's an app for that, I can put in the earbuds when the kids are asleep, and I can do lunches during that time, and I can do the Pray As You Go app or the U version. Bible app and put that as audio in my ears and it is spiritually reclaimed time that sets my heart in a different place than if I were just ticking through the activity. So we try to do that uh, kind of on our own and set aside that kind of time. We also try to engage our kids in these rhythms of rest. There's uh, what we refer to as like five seconds of sanity at the beginning of dinner. And we have to really work to protect and preserve it, but it's worth it. In those five seconds of sanity before we say a mealtime prayer, we're all sitting down together, all of us, including the four that are under 10, and we discipline ourselves to kind of hold our body still, right? Iris and Ezra and Reuben and June. And this space is worth fighting for because in those moments we experience together inhaling the breath that God's giving us, deeply into our lungs and exhaling that back out. And we work toward training our kids to do that. And you get a little whiff of meal to come and it's glorious, right? The Bible talks about rhythms of rest and it's not all the same, so there's good news in that. We have freedom to customize. There's bad news in that in that we have to figure it out and try to translate it to our own lives. Psalm 119, 164 says, Seven times a day I praise you. Psalm 55, verse 17 says, Evening, morning, and noon I cry out to you in distress and you hear my voice. Deuteronomy 6, verse 7 talks about the rhythms of a given day and keeping the commandments of God and the things of God close to our hearts. And says, talk about them when you sit at home. This is that sitting down together to enjoy a meal at whatever times you can preserve that. This is, uh, and then it says, when you walk along the road. So this is that drive time for us, commute time. How can you redeem commute time in the car as something that is more spiritually edifying than getting really hacked off at the people around you in other cars? It can be done. When you lie down, bedtime, how do you go peacefully off to sleep? And when you get up, how can you set the tone so that you go joyfully to the work that awaits you in a given day? And here we're talking about that daily work-a-day world that looks different for every single one of us. This is not a day of rest, weekend mode kind of thing that I'm talking about. We have decisions to make, and ultimately it kind of comes down to this, right? That we need to make choices, yes and no, on any number of different things. And we have this recognition that's in the backdrop that societies that have the accelerator to the floor are doomed to become godless. That's well and good for society. But what does that mean when you personalize that? How can you preserve 
a cadence of rest in the midst of a lot of activity in whatever way that looks like. So the handout's going to lead you into that. An honest gut check on 24 hours of given time and trying to account for what that looks like. When I do these kinds of exercises, it's really helpful because I learn at least a couple of things. One, I waste more time than I think I do, and so therefore I'm not as busy as I might have imagined that I actually am. And then number two, things often take longer than I originally anticipate and plan for. And so I can do better to account for the margin of error that surrounds all of that or just the human equation and element in it. When you're calibrated around all that, it's easier to see the space for rest and to reclaim it. Name it as your own. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. In other words, there's a time to be on demand that God's provided. And there's a time also to be off the clock in the ways that God's inviting when are you protecting that time to be off the clock in your day-to-day -day reality? Next week, weekly rest, Sabbath, the cornerstone of biblical rhythms of rest. Let's close this message time in prayer. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, oh Lord, we know how restless we are. We know how overscheduled we can be. We know how antsy we can get. Lord, help us to say no in some intentional ways, in some grace-filled ways. Help us to say yes to only so many good things in order to protect that time for the best things. Lord, lead us into these unforced rhythms of grace that we can realize the gift that you've already given us that was never taken away that you eternally extend. Lord, we pray all of these things, seeking peace that we can discover it in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, and so that we have peace to share with those that we interact with on a daily basis. Your peace, the peace that passes understanding. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.